this is an inspiring room to be in. This is an inspiring panel to be part of. Um, and it's been amazing to be here with everybody today who won these amazing victories in 2018. It is a pleasure and an honor to be with all of these uh, true heroes of, of our democracy. Um, this is our moment. This is our time. Reform won big in 2018. It won in red states, in blue states, in purple states. We all hate democracy. Excuse Whoa, no. <laughs> we all hate gerrymandering. <laughs> uh, and yet, what we have seen since November is that politicians love gerrymandering. Politicians do not want to give up this important power that they have held on to for so long, that they worked as well as they did behind the scenes before all of us caught on to what was going on in those rooms, a process that they deliberately obscured to make more complicated than it is in order to entrench their own political power. Um, we've seen in Michigan, we've seen in Missouri what is happening. Um, the details of turning reform into a reality are going to be extraordinarily hard. It's going to be as big a challenge as winning some of these reforms were in this last election. And there's going to be multiple fronts for us to be thinking about as we move ahead and try to implement the hard-won reforms from 2018 and to get ahead of this before the next redistricting cycle, which is coming up on us extraordinarily fast. There will be a political uh, front to try and protect and defend all of these new victories. There will be a legal uh, a front as we continue to see a gerrymandering, a litigation a work its way through the state courts and also federal courts returning to the, the Supreme Court um, this uh, spring with the cases from North Carolina and Maryland, and then with the case from Wisconsin not far behind. We'll be looking at a very different the Supreme Court than the Wisconsin and Maryland cases had a year ago. Uh, uh, Justice Kennedy, who was always so interested in these, in these topics, who was always the swing vote that um, the reformers targeted, is no longer on the court. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh remains kind of a question mark as far as what he thinks about a redistricting and gerrymandering. And we have some new, um, new mathematical standards um, out of the cases in North Carolina that are at once particularly clear, but also perhaps a little more complex. So um, as Christian talked about, uh, we will have to see how a chief justice who has referred to much simpler uh, standards as sociological gobbledygook deals with um, a Monte Carlo a Markov chain that will be an interesting test. And then there is the act of trying to implement all of these standards and to build commissions that work. Um, and our panel here today is um, an incredible one of folks who have done all of this work and really led the way on, on, all, of these, on all of these fronts. Um, we have Kathy Fang. Um, who is the National Redistricting Coordinator of Common Cause, um, a longtime executive director of Common Cause here in California, um, and just one of the absolute architects um, and determined warriors for a change across the country. Um, not only the victories that she won here, which are on the redistricting naturally, but also on automatic voter registration, same day, a registration, a sunshine laws, money and politics, a, a wealth of knowledge and information that I know everybody in this room who has been working on these reforms has taken a full advantage of. We have Eric 
and McGee of the Public Policy Institute of California, um, who is the creator of the efficiency gap. Um, uh, uh, Justice Alito's a young researcher. Um, we can talk about that. <laughs> um, a, um, a regular commentator on, on these topics, NPR, the Washington Post, also um, in law journals across the country, earned his uh, political science um, uh, doctorate at Berkeley. Correct. Um, we have Nicholas Stephanopoulos, um, who was one of the, along uh, with Eric, the, the co-author of the article that uh, gave us the efficiency gap on the University of, Co of Chicago Law Review back in 2014. Um, a litigator who has been at the heart of the cases in Wisconsin and also North Carolina, um, who has taught at Harvard Law School, University of Chicago, and published widely across uh, law journals and also popular press on gerrymandering and redistricting. Um, and Jean Rayoff, who was on the commission that did such amazing work here in California, um, one of the independent uh, commissioners um, who did the work of taking districts in the state that had been gerrymandered and twisted for so long and reassembling these communities of interest and really making elections responsive and small d democratic again uh, here in the state. Um, so, so let me start over here with you. You have done the work of drawing these lines, of building a commission from the ground up. Um, what is the basic first advice you have to give to the folks in Michigan and in Colorado and elsewhere who are going to have to do this now? I think um, you know, our selection process was, as you know or may know, quite rigorous. And I think that one of the first things you're going to have to do because your selection processes are entirely different from California's is to make sure that you cast a wide net, that you make sure that your citizens are well informed about serving on the commission, about the process for applying, and that you cast that net wide enough to reach all the diverse corners of your state, whatever they might be. Uh, people, I actually visited Michigan earlier this, or last year, a year ago, uh, as, as a part of our ASH grant activities going across the country to take our experience uh, to others. And a lot of voters in Michigan expressed concern about the selection process. We were more thoroughly vetted than any state le legislator ever has been. <laughs> and uh, it may not be that way for your state, but I think there are a lot of ways that you can take the questions that we were asked, and those are readily available in our applications online, and you can use those to make voters aware of the kinds of qualities you're looking for, because it's all going to come down to the people that actually end up serving. Um, uh, Kathy, you helped, and helped is probably minimizing what uh, you did to, to actually write this. You were the, the driver um, and the lead author of so much of this. Um, as you look back yourself on how um, the commission was implemented um, in California and how the work went, what advice do you have uh, that is most crucial for uh, folks who are starting off in doing this work? That's a good question. Okay, I don't know if I just turned this on, good. Hi, um, so I would say, first of all, Remember the passion in your belly. Why are you doing this? Um, for me, it was that I was very involved in California in organizing Asian and Pacific American communities to participate in what was then the legislative process. And I fervently believed that if we showed up at those hearings, uh, that they would listen to us. And when I realized it was all a dog and pony show, when I got a phone call from a particular legislator from San Francisco who said, Kathy, 
you're not going to put another fucking Asian in my district. Since we're dropping F-bombs today. <laughs> <laughs> and this was in San Francisco that is one in three fucking Asians, so it's kind of hard to move a line without accidentally putting one in her district. You know, it just, it was like that arrogance, that sense of, of uh, ownership of areas that, that she could decide who was in and who wasn't. That's what was my fire in my belly, right? That was a justice that we needed to make sure was built back into our process of elections, right? People should have a choice of candidates. And if we needed to make a choice and that person wasn't the right one, people should have the ability to, to have a meaningful choice when it came to elections. So that was my fire in my belly. And I think all of us, whether it's reading Rat Fucked or you have a situation where your community has been um, silenced or you see how Democrats and Republicans are fighting and there's gridlock and we can't pass a budget, whatever that fire in your belly is, tap into that. Because that, you're going to need it for a very long time. This is not a slow process. It took us so many years. We thought that we could negotiate with the legislature. <laughs> we were stupid and thank you Michigan for just skipping all of that and, and Utah and Missouri and Colorado, you just, you know, just went there. Um, Second thing that I'll say is what Katie said, which is listen to the people, believe in them, hear their voices, lift those up, right? Um, there's a million ways to talk about redistricting. When we had our consultants in 2008, they all said, don't use the word redistricting. We're in a different place now. People understand it, they get why it's wrong, and I think you need to kind of listen first and then tap into that, that energy of conversation that happens. Um, we, on a good day, Kent, when we were negotiating and thinking about it, we thought, God, we hope that like 100 people will apply for California's <laughs> redistricting commission. And maybe if we really do, do good outreach, it'll be 600. And I don't know if folks know this number, but in California, 30,000 people put their name into the hat for the redistricting commission. They wrote essays, they answered personal questions, they were interviewed, right? And 30,000 people out of that, you know then that you've got the best and the brightest and the most talented people, people who are really committed to it for all the right reasons, not people who are like just shills for po politicians who are in that mix. And that's how we ended up with our fabulous 14, right? And I'm so proud of our commissioners because you showed the world, because everybody who was like cynical and naysayers, they said, oh, well, now that you put in all these restrictions on who can, who can put their name in the hat, who will possibly apply, right? Who would be interested? Who would have the expertise? And we said, actually, California and every state is full of amazing, talented people who care about their democracy. And you don't have to be a redistricting expert all day long. You just have to listen. And then, so it comes back to, you have to listen to people. And so they had over 100 hearings around the state, and they listened. So what I think is, all along the way, you have to empower other people to stand there with you. And then the third thing I'll say is, be vigilant. Democracy doesn't just happen because you wrote a perfect little law, you passed it, and then you can walk away, right? You have to be vigilant. So every step of the way, if you've created the thing, stay with it. Make sure that the, the, the legislature doesn't try to defund it. Make sure that um, the, the selection process is really robust. Make sure that the outreach process is amazing. When the first 600 people put their name into the hat from California, they were from Sacramento, mostly, right? And that makes sense, because those are people who are paying attention to politics. So let's reach out and make sure that San Diego and Orange County and LA and all parts of California, San Francisco, they're all included in that. They know to apply. That's how we got our robust 30,000. So vigilance is really important. And, and so this is a, a not a couch potato job, as Governor Schwarzenegger would say. Get off the couch, because if we're going to do it, we have to remain committed. You can't just say, I voted for it, and that's enough. It's, it's every step of the way making sure that once you've had the baby, you don't just throw it out. <laughs> you've got to stay up late nights. You've got to take care of it 24-7. And then that child eventually grows up. And even then, you're with that, your, your, your kid for the rest of their lives. right? So, and that's, it's that kind of commitment. Sorry, did that get all scary? So yeah, fire in the belly, all that. OK, thanks. <laughs> Uh, Nick, you've been at the heart of, of two key uh, cases in North Carolina and Wisconsin that are moving forward uh, rapidly towards the Supreme Court. Could you give us an overview of, of where litigation stands on gerrymandering across the country? 
Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, let me just first say why we have to have uh, litigation in the first place. Uh, I think commissions are clearly uh, the first best option for, uh, for fighting and for preventing uh, gerrymandering. And uh, in states like California that have uh, well-structured, well-functioning commissions uh, in place, there's uh, virtually no need for uh, anti-partisan gerrymandering litigation uh, because you can trust the commissions uh, not to gerrymander. Uh, so, you know, litigation is, a, is an issue only in the problem states. Uh, the states that don't have commissions, that are unlikely to get commissions soon, uh, that's where we need uh, other weapons to, uh, to fight gerrymandering because the, the best option uh, isn't available. Uh, okay, so quick summary of where things stand on the litigation front. Uh, the Wisconsin case last term that I was heavily involved in uh, was punted by the Supreme Court. Uh, all the court said was that the, uh, the, litigant, the litigants hadn't yet proven their, uh, their injury, and so the case was sent back to the lower court so that the plaintiffs would have a chance to demonstrate that they were uh, unnecessarily cracked or packed in the particular districts that they live in. Uh, that was the standard the court set for standing. Uh, show me that you were cracked or packed, and show me that this cracking or packing uh, was avoidable because there exists a different district configuration where you are uh, uncracked or unpacked. Um, so Wisconsin is now uh, back in the lower court uh, for that reason. Uh, in North Carolina, we already had in the record this evidence of uh, avoidable cracking or packing for uh, all of our plaintiffs. Uh, and so the North Carolina District Court was able to move really quickly after the Supreme Court's decision uh, to find that the plaintiffs had standing throughout the state and to uh, reaffirm its uh, original decision uh, striking down North Carolina's congressional map. Uh, so that's one of the two cases that is now pending in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, that's the case I'm more familiar with. So let me just say a couple of words about the North Carolina case. Uh, one point is that the facts are really unusually egregious in North Carolina. Uh, for example, the North Carolina legislature actually passed uh, an official criterion called partisan advantage. <laughs> Uh, on paper, you know, that's literally the name of the criterion, uh, and it says that Republicans shall have 10 members of the North Carolina congressional delegation, and Democrats shall have three members. You know, it's not up for the people. The criterion specifies the partisan makeup of the delegation. Um, second point is, you know, notwithstanding Chief Justice Roberts's uh, comments about gobbledygook, we have a lot of gobbledygook in the North Carolina case. Uh, we have the full suite of quantitative measures of gerrymandering that uh, political scientists like Eric have come up with, uh, not just a single metric. Uh, and for the first time in federal litigation, uh, we have lots and lots of uh, randomly generated computer simulated maps. Um, in case you're curious, if you tell a computer, match the enacted North Carolina map on every single nonpartisan criterion, but don't try to gerrymander uh, in favor of the Republicans or the Democrats, uh, you end up with pretty balanced maps in North Carolina, and you never end up with a 10-3 Republican split uh, in the congressional delegation. Um, but we're now facing uh, a less sympathetic Supreme Court with uh, uh, Justice Kavanaugh's uh, uh, substitution for Justice Kennedy, um, who had been the, the justice that we thought was the, the gettable swing vote in this area. So we have better evidence, uh, uh, egregious facts, but probably a less receptive Supreme Court to work with. Um, so you know, what the outcome of that will be, I think, is, is anyone's guess. Um, I know, Eric, you've been a proponent of the kinds of information and the kind of data that you think uh, commissions ought uh, to use 
when they are talking about drawing these lines. Um, and uh, one of the things you're in favor of is using political data, which folks in California uh, decided not to do last time. It was one of the, the possibilities, but they didn't do it. Um, I talk a little bit about uh, why you think that's important and a good road for going forward. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, where I come from is this, um, you know, my, my, uh, my role in all of this stuff has mostly been to propose metrics that uh, people can use that can provide a sort of transparent and replicable um, means of assessing where a particular plan is at. Um, and I think that plays a very important role in terms of understanding the potential impact of a plan in the way that when we're worried about partisan gerrymandering, when we're worried about uh, a lack of competition, we want to have some kind of uh, clear way of identifying um, you know, what that means so that it doesn't look like you're just sort of reproducing a, uh, um, a, a, some kind of nefarious um, intent all over again, right? Uh, so I think what is going on in the, in the court cases is actually very interesting because it highlights, I mean, the, the, the challenge in the court arena is that the, the, the courts are, are really, really reluctant to take this step that you know, everybody in this room sort of feels like seems pretty obvious, right? Well, you have these bad plans, we should do something about them. Uh, and the challenge is that you have to sort of hold the court's hand and bring them there and say, um, this is an okay step to take. You're not gonna completely blow up American democracy when you do this. You're actually gonna make it a better American democracy if you do this. Um, and that's a real challenge, and I think the kind of systematic measures, um, not just mine, but others as well, can, uh, can play a role there. Um, I think where this kind of gets into the commission world is that the nice thing about commissions is we don't have to sort of tell the, the courts. I think Nick is right that, that the, a court approach is uh, a way of trying to ensure that, this is, that there's guardrails in every state as opposed to just states that where it's relatively, I know, again, like obviously the people who did these, uh, adopted these commissions in the states that have done it, it wasn't, doesn't seem easy at all, but in some other states it could be even harder, right? Um, so it provides that kind of universality, which I think is really important. Um, but at the same time, uh, the, um, uh, the court approach doesn't allow you to say what you actually affirmatively want to have, right? It just says, uh, you know, we're trying to find a, a, um, a boundary that is discoverable in the Constitution, uh, either in the U.S. Constitution, in the case of the litigation that Nick is talking about, or in a state constitution like in Pennsylvania. Uh, what I think is really neat about the commissions is you can s instead turn that around and say, what do we think is fair? What do we think makes sense, right? And, I, and these laws tend to have a lot of criteria that, uh, that specify sort of what fairness means. A lot of it is sort of geographic. And then, depending on the law, they'll also say something about not favoring parties one way or the other. Uh, my own feeling is that it's important to allow a commission um, to use partisan data and some of these metrics that are out there now, which are, again, by their very essence, they are transparent, they're replicable, um, they're, they're not easy to to, um, to monkey with, to use that information to try and set sort of a, a goal for when you're drawing your plans um, and to do it in advance of, um, uh, to sort of say, this is the goal we're gonna be aiming for even before they draw the districts. Then draw the districts and then you can't be sort of accused of trying to um, explain away a result that you've already produced. Um, so I think, and there's, and the, each commission um, kind of does it in a different, uh, to a different degree. Uh, the, the current proposal that's um, uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives, H.R. 1, um, actually forbids the use of partisan data, and I personally think that's not a good idea because we, we want, um, with these commissions, we want districts that are compact and contiguous uh, and respect <coughs> communities of interest and, and all, all the rest, but we also want the result to be fair. And we also want the result to be competitive. And if you want those things, um, you should empower your commission to pursue those things. 
the job of doing this falls to 15 people from all across the state, all different. You had all different political backgrounds. You had all different racial and ethnic backgrounds. Um, and you had to come together. I feel like I'm narrating the, the trailer of the, the Breakfast Club or something here. For a Saturday a detention to, um, <laughs> to um, I draw district maps. Um, would you talk about how the 15 of you built a trust across political lines, how you develop the kinds of working relationships that allow for the tough decisions that had to be made? I can tell you where all the best happy hours are in Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we've been together nine years now, so we really are pretty good friends by this time. Uh, the people that were young at the time are now middle-aged. And some of the rest of us are now on Medicare. So uh, it's been a long, a long road. But I think there are a couple of things that stand out about how we came together as a commission. More than one thing, more than a couple. But first of all, you, you got a group of, and it's actually 14, 14 people who came to this committed to making the history, being part of the history, but commit, committed to making a difference. And I think that's, you know, when you start from that point, it's not so hard to kind of ignore some of the more obvious differences. Um, secondly, we made a point, and I think I give Cynthia Dye, a lot of, Commissioner Dye, a lot of credit for this. We made a point to socialize. You know, we were, could not discuss our mapping business outside of an open meeting, so, we took the opportunity to have dinner together to, you know, whatever hotel's happy hour and um, really get to know each other. So it's a little, little harder to, you know, get in somebody's face when you know the more personal things about them that, you know, that you have to say, oh, they, they have kind of the same things they're dealing with as I, as I do. We were all on the road a lot. That was a bonding thing, but it created a lot of pressures for people at home, especially if you had a little one at home. Uh, I was still running a business, so I was effectively working two jobs at the same time as was Farmer Stan with his bookstore. Um, so I think, I think it's the, one, the social, the social aspect of it. And I think, honestly, if you were to you know, put the 14 of us up in front of you and without tags as to what our party affiliation is, I, I think you'd have a hard time, you know, getting every single one right. There, there just was not that uh, intense part, uh, partisanship on a political level. If there's 14 of you, it means three of you probably backed herpes. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying. It wasn't me, okay. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, uh, Kathy, we're running out of initiative states. The road in the federal courts is uncertain, and we're rapidly approaching 2020. Are there small fixes we can be thinking about to this process, perhaps in some states where the process was most egregious last time, that we ought to be thinking about with some urgency now in the legislative arena? I love those odds. <laughs> but here's what I'm going to say. I think we have to aim high. As Governor Schwarzenegger said, don't just shoot for 50, shoot for 100%. Um, so what I'll say is that there still are a lot of uh, initiative states that are actively crafting language right now, right? So uh, I don't know if I'm like revealing the end of the movie or anything, but I think we should watch out for Oregon. We should look at Arkansas. We should look at even states that have a really hard process. They have to go through two votes of the legislature and then have a vote of the people, like Virginia and Pennsylvania and Maryland. They have a potential because they have people power behind them, right? There's negotiation right now um, in some of those legislatures, so I shouldn't say it because it's so secret right now, but there's negotiation in some of those legislatures where they're looking at what the demographic changes are going to yeah. be by 2021. And they're saying, oh shit, right? If we're 50-50 right now, and if things keep going in the direction that we're, they're going, 
as an insurance policy, we probably should build in a much fairer mm -hmm. system because if the other side wins, Come punishment across. can be very cruel. So I was going to say another word, but I'll just say cruel. Um, <laughs> So what I think is that, you know, whether that's political expediency or yeah. um, the energy of the people, I think what we need to be ready for is um, to take every opportunity possible. <clears throat> Small fixes. So I know Sam Wong's there and he talks a lot about, you know, depending on the state that you're in, make sure that your state has a transparent availability of the data and even the lines and the software that the state's going to be using. Sometimes they hide it all away, even the data that they're using. So making sure that that's available for people. There are um, some great people who are developing apps to give communities just the ability to come and give testimony and tell their stories so that that becomes another layer. Even if you're creating a parallel process, so for Common Cause, we're working with a lot of states to create a parallel process to develop citizen maps, even if they don't have a citizen's commission. The reason why it's important is, A, it's a useful tool to shame the legislature. They're doing wrong, hey, there's a possibility of doing right here. And the other piece is that if it gets litigated, when we go to the courts, we can say, hey, courts, you don't have to have a whole new process. We went around the state. There was a lot of citizen input, and here's an alternative set of maps that are possible. Um, I'll say that in the litigation front, it's so important that the two cases that the Supreme Court is potentially going to take up by the end of March, one comes from Maryland, which is a Democratic gerrymander, and one comes from North Carolina, which is a Republican gerrymander. Because for this Supreme Court, we all know the makeup, so I don't have to tell you about that, right? But what they need to see is that there are two cases that come together where both sides have been behaving badly and where the rule applies equally to this child and this child, right? <laughs> Everybody has to finish their dinner before they get the ice cream. Um, and so what's really important is, as we move forward, we need to talk about this. Sean, you said this, Catherine, you said this, Katie, you said this, Governor Schwarzenegger, you know this, right? Kent, right, in Colorado, it's gotta be bipartisan, right? Everything has to be something where the rules apply equally to Democrats and Republicans. And when we talk about it, you don't just go and say, oh, I'm gonna litigate in North Carolina as Common Cause and League of Women Voters are doing just because it's a Republican gerrymander. No, we have to support Maryland's case as well because that's an example where the Democrats said, we're gonna bury Republicans six feet under. And the way we're gonna draw those lines, we're gonna make it so that their two seats that they were winning go down to one seat, right? That is just as egregious and just as wrong as when, when Republicans do it. So our outrage has to be fair. It has to be nonpartisan or transpartisan. It has to apply to everybody equally. That's the only way that we're gonna have a national conversation where Americans come together and say, you know what, this, this first, this is wrong, and we need to tackle it together. Um, I'll just say one last piece, and I already forgot what the question was, sorry. <laughs> but one last piece is um, there are small changes that we can go for, but I think in every state, as we said before, it's got to be tailored. So I think there was a gentleman from Dallas. I don't think we leave Texas off the table. We should be talking about Texas and Florida and Illinois and New York, all of those states that have big populations, but each one of them may be a slightly different approach. I think that you don't have to sacrifice minority rights to also say that it should be fair on a partisan level, right? This is a, a choice where it's, it's a series of give and takes, but we as a population, we know when right is right. So what I'll say is that the gentleman from Dallas, if you're still here and you still are active in Texas, let's talk. Yeah, let's talk. Let's talk about how it's possible, what's possible in Texas. Austin, by the way, adopted exactly what California had. They took our Proposition 11 language. They created a 14-member commission, and they created a, an independent citizens redistricting process. So maybe in Texas we have to go city by city, but we can win this. Can I just uh, piggyback on what Kathy just said? So uh, first of all, in res with respect to the bipartisanship, um, I looked, did, did an analysis of all of the previous efforts in California to pass, um, to pass a, some kind of commission-style reform. Um, uh, uh, as the governor said earlier, there were a number of them um, going back into the, into the 80s. And the key difference with the one um, that finally passed was that bipartisan effort. That was one of the biggest changes, and it's really a, 
you know, I think a feather in the cap of Kathy and the uh, other organization, the governor and every, all the people who worked hard to pull together that really broad coalition because um, that took it, it had always been perceived as a, as a Republican thing before in California, um, and the Democratic Party really opposed it. And then um, when it finally was passed, it, it became a kind of a bipartisan thing, and, and, and it stopped having that, that sense of a, of a power grab, regardless of whether it was actually a power grab or not, right? Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, uh, in terms of what's coming up in the next cycle, uh, I, I did want to put in a plug for having good data um, to at least uh, shine the light on the process in the states where there's not going to be a commission. Um, and we're just going to have the old-fashioned process, especially if there's divided control. And so there's a potential for a negotiation between the two sides where they can bring, you know, they can sort of arm each other, uh, arm themselves against each other with neutral data, right? And one of those things that is really missing if people want to go out as an army of, of labor um, to try and uh, make this happen, we really need um, the shape files for precincts. That's the way to, to the, the, the key piece that's really hard to get in a lot of states. And um, Nick and I are part of an effort with um, Simon Jackman, uh, who uh, used to be at Stanford and is now uh, decamped to Australia, um, and, uh, and also Nick's wife, uh, Ruth Greenwood, um, uh, to create a website, uh, which we call Plan Score. It actually is up and running right now if you want to go take a look at it, um, where you can upload a new map that you drew, and it will produce uh, the metrics, the various metrics of partisan advantage, so you can sort of see where it lands on, on a, a range of different um, criteria. Uh, and we hope to have that going for as many states as we possibly can in the, um, the next time around. And we're kind of working on that. As, as, um, as uh, I just said, it's, it's hard, right? There's a lot of effort involved. But that's something. We, we actually did it for Pennsylvania, and it played a, a, a role in the conversation in Pennsylvania when that court case was, um, was live. So, Before we try to throw it all open to you for a little bit, um, uh, Nick, um, how concerned do you think we ought to be that not only about the, the cases from North Carolina and Wisconsin, but also about the possibility that um, a court without Justice Kennedy um, goes ahead and undoes the Arizona a decision that allows independent commissions to go forward? Um, is that something we ought to be thinking about? And if so, um, I open it up to others on the panel. If, if the commission mechanism is taken from us, how do we guard against that, and what do we do if it happens? Uh, okay, great. Yeah, so there, there is, unfortunately, uh, a looming legal threat to redistricting commissions that operate at the congressional level. Uh, the, the rationale for this, this threat is that uh, the Constitution says that uh, the legislature of each state has the power to set the time, place, and manner of federal elections uh, in that state. And so there's an argument that when you have a voter initiative that bypasses the legislature, that then creates an independent commission that also bypasses the legislature, uh, well, then all of a sudden you have the time, place, and manner of U.S. House elections in Arizona, in California, in other places, uh, not being set by the legislature, but instead being set by this other mechanism, you know, the people who then create a non-legislative commission. Uh, so that argument failed in a Supreme Court case uh, three years ago. Uh, but it narrowly failed. It failed by a 5-4 vote the other way, where Roberts wrote the dissenting opinion for the four justices, uh, and Kennedy was one of the five justices in the majority. Um, so my view is that uh, new Justice Kavanaugh will be very sympathetic to this argument because it is a, a, a textualist, uh, uh, argument, which is exactly the kind uh, of claim that Kavanaugh has uh, seemed to be open to uh, in his decade uh, on the, the DC uh, circuit court. Uh, 
So I think if this case were coming up to the court now, the betting would be that, uh, in fact, congressional commissions would be struck down. Um, the saving grace for reformers is that you have this recent precedent on exactly this issue. Uh, and so I, I, you know, I, I don't think that uh, Roberts considers this a, a burning topic that he would want to spend limited court capital on. Uh, so I am somewhat optimistic that the court will just find ways to avoid hearing this case uh, because it would be quite embarrassing to reverse uh, such a recent precedent uh, so soon. Um, but if that case came down that way and said that congressional redistricting commissions created by voter initiative uh, are unconstitutional. There needs uh, to be an American revolution. What's that? Yeah. Then that's it. That's it. We're throwing it down because that's they, they cannot take that power away from states when we the people created it. So period. I'm calling all the arms. We're doing it. So re revolution is, is one approach. Uh, uh, one thing to note is that this argument only pertains to federal elections. So uh, uh, commissions that do state legislative redistricting are completely unscathed by this argument. Uh, the other point, though, is that Congress is completely unscathed by this argument. So the, the same provision that says the legislature thereof gets to set the time, place, and manner of elections also gives Congress basically plenary authority to step in and override the state legislatures. So HR1, the, you know, the, the pending bill in the US House, would do exactly that. It would invoke Congress's elections clause power and say that uh, we now, the federal government, are requiring commissions to be used for congressional redistricting around the country. Uh, and nothing in this line of judicial reasoning in any way uh, undercuts Congress's power to do that. Um, so it could be a Pyrrhic victory for opponents of reform. You know, they might be able to strike down, you know, one or two commissions, but they might make uh, big bang universal federal reform uh, a lot more likely because that would be then be the only option for getting uh, congressional redistricting commissions uh, through. We're, we're close to out of time. Are there one or two burning questions from the room for this amazing panel? Hi, I'm Sam Wong from Princeton University. I run the Princeton Gerrymandering Project. I have a question uh, regarding data. Data's come up a few times. Kathy's brought it up. Eric's brought it up. Um, my question has to do with the obtaining of data. So I can tell you at Princeton with our gerrymandering project, we look up to the, uh, the plan score effort because it's, it's a leading effort that's really uh, paved the way in Pennsylvania. Uh, we admire your work. But one thing we've noticed as we've been trying to gather shapefiles, as Eric has mentioned, is that it's a lot of work to gather data in even one state. And I guess my question, or is an invitation, is is there a way to coordinate efforts, uh, the plan score effort, I know of efforts at Florida, Michael McDonald and Brian Amos, uh, Moon Duchin at Tufts. Seems like there are a lot of data nerds like us working on these things. And I'm wondering, there's a lot of energy in this room for reform. Uh, this is a little bit in the weeds. And I'm wondering if there's some way to put those efforts together in time for, um, for 2021. Uh, we have our own effort that we're going to unveil soon called Open Precincts. But we think that we can learn a lot from people like you all, uh, you know, and as I said, these other groups. I'm wondering how we could put that together to build something that's going to match the, um, the intensity and breadth of what regular people have been doing on the, on the uh, advocacy side. Uh, it's a very good question. So I think the, um, the short answer is it, it's, uh, so first of all, I, I want to mention that we have one other person on the plan, plan score team that I forgot to mention, which is Mike McGursky, and he, he's coded the site, and he's amazing with um, geographic data, and I, I, I want to give a shout out to him because he actually has made the site possible. He is um, the Elvis of GIS. Yeah, I mean, he's like, he's, he's amazing, and, uh, and without him, it would not be up and running, so. Um, uh, and he has actually helped get some of these shape files. In some cases, we got, I mean, I think it was in Pennsylvania, we, we just sort of, uh, the equivalent of it dropping off the back of a turnip truck, you know, I mean, it's, it's the kind of thing where it's not, sometimes you have to have a connection, and sometimes it's a matter of, I think, Sam, you know, it's a matter of calling yeah, individual we, counties, you we, know. We called every clerk in Virginia. Yeah, it was just say, hey, you know, do you, have, do you have this file? Would you be willing to share it with me? I mean, that's not how democracy should work, but that's sort of where we're at. Um, 
I, I, it may be that, I, I, you know, I don't know if the FairMaps incubator can be a sort of coordinating effort for something like that. Um, if, I mean, if some of it comes down to, you know, we, again, we have passionate people, um, many of them uh, with data capabilities uh, who can go out and just sort of be an army of, of labor to, as a labor of love to make this happen. Um, but that's kind of, we're, we're, we want to expand the number of states we do. We do have some states that are sort of lined up that we, we think we can go live with at some point. Uh, but, but whether we'll get all the states that we want is really an open question. And so I don't have an easy answer to that question, but, I, but it's definitely something we should be working on. It just feels like a good time to bring people together. Hi, my name is David Azevedo. Um, I'm actually with AARP California, so thank you Yay. so much, Governor, and many others uh, thank who you, have AARP. mentioned. Thank you, Of course, yeah. It was a huge victory back then, and very interested, very intriguing dialogue here. Um, I did have a question for counties and cities. Yeah. If they were to make redistricting commissions, yeah. obviously, the more local you go, the more nonpartisan you get, and many cities uh, and counties do have nonpartisan seats. How would you come about with making criteria uh, if you can't necessarily have Republicans or Democrats? You can, sure, but if cities were interested in other criteria yeah. to come up with their own commissions yeah. that are nonpartisan? David, perfect question. Um, I actually think that um, redistricting reform at the local level is where we need to focus on, and I think there was another David who was asking about LA City, so absolutely. We actually have a website. It's based on California, but we're looking at expanding it to Texas and other places. It's called localredistricting.org. And you go through a series of questions about sort of values that you want, things that you're looking for, and it puts together a, a proposed ordinance, right? And you can tweak it along the way. So it's a kind of create your own adventure type of process. Um, and what it also does is it compares what other cities are doing. I think the key thing is that you can have a set of criteria um, based on the values of that, that community that take into account like protecting um, communities of interest. So one of the key things that we start with is having that conversation about where your community is, right? Whether that's a neighborhood, or maybe it's a business corridor, or maybe it's something else that the community feels really important, like coastline or uh, protection along the valley against fires, right? We had a lot of that kind of testimony in California where you suddenly realized, oh, I hadn't thought about communities that way, right? But when you let those that testimony bubble up, people self-identify about what's important to them, and then that helps you understand what the values are. When we start with that piece, like creating something that's really relevant for that community, I think it starts to reflect what they think is important. There's, there's a series of questions that, that guide you through that, right? Um, what I'll say is this, um, this is not total rocket science. It feels like it's hard, but it's not. There's a lot of tools that are out there like that. Um, all of the, the websites that we just talked about. But there's also organizations that have done it before too. So AARP, right, League of Women Voters, Common Cause, um, Campaign Legal Center, we're all here having done it a couple times. And our telephone numbers are all on the website, so just Google us, right? And we have folks who will sit and talk about, let's think this through with you and help you draft, right? We're not the high-priced lawyers you know, of, of big law firms. We really are there as public servants. And so to the extent that any city um, or county is interested in tackling this, give us a call or email us. That's what we're, that's what we're trying to create. Um, in California, we have some huge resources, um, and so I'll just start with that. One last pitch. Um, we're in 2019. At the end of this year is when the California Redistricting Commission application process opens up. All you all here, if you're from California, raise your hand, right? If you've voted in the last couple of elections, if you're a person of honor, if you're a person who's willing to listen, if you're a person who's civically engaged and you didn't just get off of the couch or out of you know, somebody's basement. Um, <laughs> what I'd say is, this job is for you. You just heard it's not easy, right? No job is easy but this is one that's so important. And so we're hoping to break all records. It's not just 30,000. Let's blow the roof off and say it's 100,000, right? People who apply. Because when a large number of people apply or a large number of people donate, right, or a large number of people get involved in signing a petition, that's when we take our democracy into our own hands. So let's not be, let it be a spectator sport. 
This is something that Californians can do. Put your name in the hat. You might be amazed. You might be one of those amazing 15, 14 people who get chosen and represent this state to the rest of the country, not just our, our state. Put your name in the hat and put your hands together for this amazing panel. Thank you. <laughs>